you know, Ben and uh, Ting and Chris will tell us how it's done, benefits of it, is it hard, is it easy, is it worth it? So, Ben? Uh, so, my name's Ben Nelson. I live in Oconomowoc. Um, I've been driving an electric vehicle since I built an electric bicycle. Since I built an electric bicycle, uh, an electric motorcycle, and then an electric car. Uh, Chris over here, he's also worked in um, electric car conversions for a, a number of them for quite a few number of years as well. Uh, Tang, you're the latest. You just went out and bought a car, right? <laughs> so uh, we all, all three of us actually have different cars. Um, here, the blue one, which is right outside, as is the white one. Uh, the blue one belongs to Tang. That's a Chevy Volt, 2017 Chevy Volt. Uh, my white car there is a 2012 Mitsubishi iMeve. That's outside as well. And what you see those cars parked in front of is my garage, which I call my solar garage. So even though the three of us all have different cars, what we have in common is that we all have solar panels that we're powering the cars with. Um, I thought this would be kind of fun for some variety as well because uh, my car is very different from a Tesla Model S, for example. Um, they're probably actually a good example of uh, the, the ends of the spectrum. Uh, Chris, wh what's the size of the battery pack in your S? I have a 90. A 90. So my electric car has a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack in it. Chris's has a 90 kilowatt hour battery pack in it. So. That's a big difference. I mean, that's kind of like the difference between having a, a car that has a, a two gallon gasoline tank versus a 20 gallon gasoline tank. So uh, definitely there's some, some difference there. Uh, but you cannot pull a U-turn in a Tesla Model S the way you can in a Mitsubishi iMeve. And I tell you, as far as city cars go, I absolutely love my car. Um, I use it like a truck. The back seats fold down flat and I'll put whatever the heck I need in the back there, carry heavy equipment around and things like that. Uh, the Chevy Volt is a little bit different in that it's an all-electric vehicle with a relatively small battery pack. So it's got essentially the same size battery pack as what my car has in it. Um, the first generation was designed to go about 40 miles all-electric. Uh, the current generation about 50 miles all-electric. Uh, Chris, what's, what's the typical range on your car? Uh, well, I'd say when new EPA was, on mine was 294. Okay, so there you've got a car that can go almost 300 miles per charge, but at the same time that Chevy Volt also has that gasoline engine and you can just fill it up at any gas station. So it's a really, I, I think of it as the ultimate bachelor car because you can drive to and from all work, go to work all week without using a sing, single drop of gasoline. But if you wanted to drive up north and visit grandma or you know drive to California, something like that, you can do that on gas. Now, Chris is probably going to add the fact that uh, Tesla is the company that has actually invested in some fantastic uh, public charging infrastructure. And you can literally drive across country in a Tesla right now. They're the only ones that have a legitimate system of charging. Uh, my car also has a, a DC fast charger. Um, a lot of those were put up by uh, Nissan for the Leafs, but it, it's not really a, 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 com a complete system. But we can charge all of these cars off of solar power. Now, one thing I, I do want to touch on first, um, I, I just want to kind of briefly talk about um, power, energy, um, the basics of electric cars and the basics of solar, because uh, I don't know, any uh, electrical engineers in the room right now? Okay, some people know more about uh, how electricity and how solar and how electric cars work than others. So I'm going to kind of quick uh, hit the basics and then we'll get into some question and answer and discussion and, and question from the audience. But one of the very first things I want to point out is how terribly, terribly inefficient cars are. Uh, this graph up here, I know you can't read the details on it, but it shows all the energy used in the United States in total from all sources, coal, oil, solar, wind, all of those things. And, ooh, does this have a pointer? Laser pointer, yes. So all of these, for example, the bottom, that is petroleum. So um, relative, you can see how big this is. That represents relatively how much power is coming from that petroleum, as opposed to the yellow at the very top, that little tiny, tiny yellow line, that's solar we get a whole heck of a lot more power in this country from petroleum than we do from solar. But as we look across over here, these are the different areas that the various types of power are used in. 
So for example, this bottom one is transportation. We use lots and lots of oil to move around cars and trucks. But you see the much, much smaller line coming out the, the side of this. And lastly, um, that's how much useful energy we get out of it. Whereas at the top, that's how much wasted energy we have. And we waste more than half of all energy we use in this country. It literally gets wasted. And it's the absolute worst when it comes to cars. So this huge amount of petroleum going down to this little teeny, teeny, tiny bit out here. Now, of course, we do use a little petroleum in industry. Uh, natural gas we use for heating our homes. But that uh, petroleum and transportation is a really, really, really bad one. And that little tiny bit of solar up at the top, mostly that's going into residential. That's a lot of folks like us who have solar panels on our houses or our garage, and we use that electricity at home. But what's really cool with solar and electric cars is all of this waste, all of this fossil fuels, we can completely bypass that and instead literally make our own power and run our cars off of it. And I personally find that tremendously empowering. Uh, just for example, on the right here, the rejected energy, 59.1, energy services, 38.4. These are not percents. Uh, these are actually measured in quads. And a quad is an insanely huge unit of energy, which I actually had to look up to, to find out how big of a unit it is. Um, you can compare it to billions and billions of gallons of gasoline. There's so many different ways to look at it. And one was in terms of how many nuclear explosions it would be. It's a tremendous amount of power. But basically, we're wasting 59 units of energy for every 38 units of energy that, that we actually use. Um, so efficiency is important. So just to, to cover some of the basics, we'll talk about electricity, then solar, then cars. Um, most of us are familiar with watts as a unit of energy. If you had an old-fashioned traditional light bulb, it might be a 100-watt incandescent bulb. So if you leave that on for 10 hours, that's going to use uh, 1,000 watt hours or one kilowatt hour. Uh, that's the typical unit of energy that we all see on our electric bills. And of course, if you want to know how much power you actually use, that's the very first place you should go is take a look at your electric bill. A lot of electric bills show historical usage. Now, the average home in Wisconsin is very similar to the average home uh, nationally in that we tend to use about 900 kilowatt hours of energy per month. So um, keep that number in mind, that 900 kilowatt hours, because uh, how we put energy into our cars, we're going to be using that same unit of energy. And because of that, we can figure out, for example, if I put up solar panels, how far can I drive every month on just the power that I actually make myself? Uh, also in our area, electricity tends to be about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. So if you're an average person in this area, your electric bill is going to be about $117 per month plus fees. And those fees might be, for example, a meter fee. Uh, with We Energies right now, uh, I believe it's, what, $17.99? It went up, so yeah, I think it's around there. Yeah, we actually had a change with the Public Service Commission not too long ago. And basically, the power company says, look, we're going to charge you almost 20 bucks a month just to be connected. So, uh, and that will vary a little bit depending on who your uh, power provider is. Uh, some other things we want to keep in mind with electricity is current is the flow of electricity. Um, that's important because um, all of our breakers are measured in current. You might have a 15 or a 20 amp breaker for typical circuits at your house. Um, but also current creates heat. And when we talked about efficiency, that's one of those places where we lose efficiency. If you're running high current, uh, you actually lose some of the electricity to heat. Uh, especially in long distance transmission lines. Uh, and then uh, uh, we typically uh, use current when we're talking about charging batteries. So with solar, we have to keep in mind that um, we're going to use solar panels. These are photovoltaic panels. There's lots of other types of solar, like uh, uh, solar hot water, for example. You could heat, heat water with uh, a certain style of solar panel. Or even if you um, sit in your bay window on a nice sunny day, or there's the cat stretched out in the window getting warm, that's solar thermal. That's a different type of solar. Today, we're talking about 
PV, photovoltaics, and that is a technology that takes sunlight and directly converts it to electricity. Now that's going to be DC, direct current, which is not what we use in our wall outlets. So con to convert DC electricity to AC electricity, we use a device called an inverter. So a typical home solar setup would have solar panels just like this, only bigger. Um, the solar panels on my house are about 39 inches wide by 66 inches tall. They're exactly a little bit too big to pack inside my Mitsubishi, or I would have brought them with. Um, I have 24 solar panels on the roof of my garage, and sometimes people say, well, why don't you put all the solar panels right on your car? I literally couldn't fit one solar panel in my car, and I've got 24 of them on my garage. Uh, big flat places are great uh, to put solar panels, but things that move around and we would prefer to be aerodynamic, kind of a, a bad place to put solar panels. Uh, faceplate value is when you look on the back of any solar panel, it's going to have some specs and it's going to say how much power it creates. Uh, most of these right now, these larger panels for homes, anywhere from 200 to 300 watts is fairly typical. This one is good for about 15 watts. In full sun, this could run about one and a half typical home LED light bulbs. Yeah. Yes, so when we convert from DC to AC, we're going to lose a little bit of power. Uh, this is a microinverter. On my house, I'm using microinverters, so every single solar panel actually has its own device that converts the DC to AC. Uh, there's inefficiencies, there's losses there, but they're very good. Um, I think this one is rated at 97% efficient. Uh, that's, that's pretty darn good, and everything in my house runs on AC power. So to give up, you know, 3% in conversion, I'm okay with that. Uh, sometimes in very small solar systems, like let's say you got a little cabin up north somewhere, uh, you could actually run a very basic uh, solar system with something not unlike a car battery, one solar panel, and then just use DC loads. Uh, I mean, you, guys used to use like a car headlight as, as lights, for example. I actually built a small portable DC system to demonstrate um, how those are done. That was a recent project. It's sitting over there. It's called the Solar Ammo Can. Uh, I just used a plastic ammo can as a, a box, and that has a 12-volt battery in there, and that's actually designed to work with the solar panel. It's got a 12-volt light, things like that. So great for camping and things, but we're talking about solar that can run not only your entire house, garage, and car, and maybe part of your neighborhood. So this is significant uh, amounts of power here. Uh, the other thing is we're going to be talking specifically about grid tie solar power. Um, what this inverter here does is not only does it take that DC power, convert it to AC power, but it also synchronizes that power to what's coming into my house from the power utility. So I actually become a co-producer with the power company. Uh, all the electricity made with my solar panels is used in my house. Um, if I'm using a lot of electricity right then, I pull whatever extra I need from the power company. And let's say it's a nice summer day, I'm not using much power, but I'm making a lot of power. All that extra power goes back to the power company and I get paid for that. Does that show up on your bill? Yes, it does. So this is called a grid tie system. Now. Both of you guys have grid tie systems, correct? Yeah. Uh, do either of you have any battery backup? Not at the I'm moment. I'm still waiting for Tesla to deliver a number of power walls that they owe me. And I thought we'd probably maybe have you talk a little bit about that later. And, and when I get one actually delivered in the crate, I'd be happy to bring one into the, one of these meetings in the future. Uh, How long have you been waiting? Oh, uh, for the first one, I think I'm going on three years. Yeah. <laughs> Typical Tesla. Yeah. So some... some <laughs> <laughs> uh, some people may have heard of something called a Tesla Powerwall. It's a, it's a backup system in a box. Um, unfortunately, it's been the sort of thing that uh, Tesla has been really good about um, kind of bringing technologies and kind of consumerizing them in some of the same ways that Apple has. They've also been notorious for um, saying they have something, but then taking a long time to actually get it to market, unfortunately. The problem is here in the Midwest is they're, they're kind of cherry picking where they're going to. So um, you can actually get a... Uh, Powerwall installed in England right now. Yeah, but we can't uh, get them Australia in the too. here. Yeah, 
Uh, so what we're all using is a style of a solar system called a, a grid tie system. And the way that it works is that you have solar panels on your house or your garage or in your backyard, and any extra power goes back out to the power company. If you need power, like at night, you know, I'm not making any solar power at night, and on a day like this, I'm not making very much either. So any power is coming in from the power company. So it's, it's uh, you're still using this, the power company the same way you were before, but now you also have the option of creating your own power. Now the other part of it is the meter on the house is going to be changed. In the case of, uh, for example, you both have Wii Energies as your power companies. Mm -hmm. Wii Energies actually uh, has you install a second meter. One spins backwards, one spins forwards, and basically at the end of the month they just compare the two and uh, you pay the difference between the two. Now in the rare case that you're actually uh, exporting more power than uh, what you used, uh, you get paid for it or credited for it. Now that's one thing that's a little bit odd because keep in mind most of us are using around uh, 900 kilowatt hours per month. My solar makes about 600 kilowatt hours per month. So if I was the average person using electricity, I would never um, be actually like asking for a check from the power company. But what it would do is it would greatly reduce the power uh, that I have to buy from the power company. Uh, in the case at, at my house, I actually have a digital meter. So the power company just um, reprogrammed the meter. And instead of having one number on it, it has two numbers. And I've been writing them down at the beginning of every month, so I know what those numbers are for tracking them. Uh, so question? Do they reimburse you for 13 cents for kilowatt hour? I have a public, publicly owned power company that's part of a co-op. It's a nonprofit. The point of my, uh, it's Oconomowoc City Utilities, which is a member of the Wisconsin Public Power Incorporated Co-op. The point of that municipal power company is to provide electricity in the same way that uh, city water and sewer, they're not really trying to make money, they're trying to provide a, a service. Make sure that at your house you can run the faucet and you can flush the toilet. Whereas companies like We Energies are for-profit corporations, literally the reason why they exist is to make money for the stockholders. And that's, I mean, that's, they have a charter. That's literally what it says. We're here to make money for the stockholders, which unfortunately means that a big company like We Energies, what they will do is everything they possibly can to make as much money and um, give back as little as they reasonably can we can talk about under law. Doing, uh, yeah, we can maybe talk about this a little bit more at the end because it, it can get, um, get complicated. And I think there's a few hard feelings in there too. But just the, the, the 10 second version is if you have We Energies and you manage to, let's say you're very efficient, you use all LED light bulbs at home and everything, so in the summer you produce more power than what you use, you get paid or credited for that extra power, but instead of that 13 cents per hour uh, retail rate, which I, I get at my house, if you're with We Energies, they will instead pay you, what is it, 3.4 cents? Uh, it would be five, I think. Three, five off peak and like five two on peak during summer season which okay is flat flat rate i think it's about three and a half cents so basically what the power company does in that case is they will let you buy electricity from them at retail but if you sell electricity to them they will pay you wholesale prices and a lot of people that leaves a bad taste in their mouth but here's the upside an electric car it takes a fair amount of power i mean that that's going to add some of your use and I think you almost can't add too much solar to your house because if you're driving a gas car right now you're going to drive a plug-in car in the future and if you're a family and you've got two cars and one's an electric car right now and the other one's a gas one you're probably going to have maybe like a volt and a leaf in the future something along those lines. Uh, there's other excellent ways of using electricity to displace fossil fuels such as uh, mini split heaters, heat pump water heaters, um, induction uh, ranges, uh, things like that. Real quick question. Yeah, I was just Uh, we'll get to that. Um, so that's that's the basics of how a grid tie setup works. And the, uh, yeah. Just back to your solar panels and the efficiency. Would you know offhand the efficiency of a panel in terms of the, the joules that are coming from the sun and what gets converted to joules of electricity? Yes. Question about efficiency of solar panels? Like 
Solar panels are terribly inefficient, but so what? Uh, when you're pulling something out of nothing, yeah, anything yeah. better than nothing. So that, my point was that, that my question was, they were working at if you had a Marcus crystal silicon to start with, they were trying to upgrade that and change it. Solar and panels have been getting better over the years, as have batteries. Consumer grade panels, you're looking somewhere around 18 percent. I mean, something 18, probably 21. right now between maybe 18 to 20 percent. Uh, if you go for like the highest military grade, we're putting it on the International Space Station uh, efficiency panels, which are exponentially more expensive. Oh, yeah. That uh, there's no way in heck they'd ever be worthwhile at this time. Um, I've, I think I've seen them as high as well, about 32 percent. Oh, in, in the labs, they've gotten yeah. somewhere around there. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of like um, most people, well, we'd question it, but the average person doesn't say, oh, gasoline engine, well, how efficient is that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're extremely wasteful, but we have an entire country, yeah, about 15%, but we still have uh, an entire country driving them. Keep in mind, there's a big difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Um, a wood-burning stove is not all that efficient, but I can get as much free wood as I want from the yard waste site down the street. So if you have something that's free to start with, it can be terribly inefficient and it's still tremendously effective. And that's kind of where we are uh, with solar right now. So with the grid tie, um, during the day, that's when you're making the solar power because that's when the sun is out. But because uh, there's always that coming and going over the grid with a grid tie solar setup, basically you make too much power during the day and at night you're using power from the grid, you're not making power, but on average you can actually make about as much power as you use. So just a quick little example, at my house uh, my solar system is essentially 5,000 watts. If the sun's shining at it, it makes 5,000 watts. And we have about four and a quarter peak sun hours per day in our area. Now that doesn't mean the sun's only out for four hours per day. Uh, you know, right when the sun comes up, it's not very bright. In the middle of the day in the summer, you go, whoa, watch out, you're getting sunburned. So peak sun hours is a way of kind of averaging out uh, the sun and creating like a standard unit from it. If you live someplace like Arizona, they're going to have much higher peak sun hours than we do around here. But it's the easy way of doing the math. So if we have 5,000 watts of solar for four peak sun hours, that's about 20 kilowatt hours of energy per day. 30 days in a month, that's about 600 kilowatt hours. And if the average home in our area is using about 900 kilowatt hours, that means my solar would power about two thirds of the average Wisconsin or American home. And that works out to being worth about $78 worth of electricity. Uh, in general right now, if you want to have somebody install solar on your house, it's going to cost roughly $3 per watt. Uh, I've got about a 5,000 watt system. If I paid somebody else to do it for me, it probably would have cost about $15,000, but there's also some incentives. There's one through the state, and there's a 30% incentive uh, available through the federal government, which will be going away over the next couple of years but that would bring the cost, final cost out of pocket down to about $10,000 or roughly a little less than $2 per watt. And if you figured this out as though you were making an investment, it actually works out economically in a simple return on investment to about 8%. Now here's another thing too, there's a lot of good reasons to invest in solar besides that it can earn you money, save you money, or make you money. Uh, when somebody buys a Corvette and they say, hey, check out my new Corvette, nobody ever says, wow, what's your return on investment on that? Because there is none, um, because people like to buy Corvettes, but not because it saves them money. I love being able to make my own power. I also love the fact that it saves me money. So in my system, I actually installed my own solar and did it for a little over $10,000 straight out of my pocket. But then after the incentives, it brings it down to about $6,500. My solar makes about $1,000 a year worth of electricity. So in six and a half years, it literally pays for itself. And after that, I have free electricity. Um, I'm basically going to be making about $1,000 a year, you know, roughly $100 a month is coming my way. That's going straight into my kid's college fund or my pay off the mortgage early fund or anywhere else I want that money to go. 
So if we talk about cars now, uh, we kind of have a sense of energy and, um, and power. Uh, car battery sizes range anywhere from about 16 kilowatts up to about 100 uh, kilowatt hours, up to about 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, there's a range of sizes out there. And typically an electric car will go three or four miles per kilowatt hour. Now, that can kind of translate to how fast can I recharge? Uh, commonly, you'll charge at 16 or 32 amps at 240 volts. And every single car that you buy is going to come with some sort of a, a power cord right with it. So this one actually, this is Tang's. So this is uh, literally straight out the back of a Chevy Volt and the connector just plugs right into the wall, 120 volts. Now this is kind of a nice adapter because it's one of the few out there where it can also run on 240 volts. So with just a little pigtail, you can plug this into 240 volt power and then the car is going to now charge twice as fast. But even better than that, um, we're usually limited by about a 15 or 20 amp outlet and when going to 240 volts, we could go up to like maybe a 50 amp outlet. So typically we can charge at a higher current as well. Uh, that is going to be included with your car. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of times those are only 120 volts or a lot of times people want to buy a 240 volt version. Typically those at like 32 amps, usually about a $500 unit or so. Actually, well, actually uh, the Tesla UMC is about 500 bucks. Now what I was going and they, if you ask the store, they're wrong. Most of the employees at the store generally don't know what they're doing. So uh, <laughs> another nice thing with the Tesla is that the portable uh, car connector cord that comes with the car is good for both 120 and 240 volts right out of the box. It actually has this neat little connector on the end that is removable and you just stick a different plug on there. So that's kind of nice that it comes right with the car. I will say that some Tesla accessories are expensive and frankly, they're expensive cars and that's why I don't have one. Um, I wrote a check for $7,000 and bought an electric car and I'm, I'm the second owner of that car. So I, I'm a big fan of um, saving money wherever, wherever you can. But Tesla does make a, a really nice I adapter. Will, I will also note, um, this is the original Tesla mobile connector design. Uh, they just redesigned it, so if any new Tesla being purchased right now, uh, the S, the X, or the Model 3, um, they have a, it's actually a lower cost design. This one can actually provide up to 40 amp, so if you plug into like a 1450 outlet, you can get a charge rate up to 40 amps, which is 80% of a 50 amp circuit, which is illegally, for NAC, the maximum sustained rate you can draw from a 50 amp circuit. Um, the new ones have a maximum rate of 32 amp, um, and uh, they've actually brought the cost of those down more and uh, the adapters to plug into different outlet styles is actually lower cost than it was on the original design. So they've kind of learned over the last, what has it been, four or five years now and um, they've, they've managed to reduce the cost of those as well. Are, is anybody working on standardizing? Standards! <laughs> <laughs> there are only two standards for your regular charging. Um, quick charging is different. That could be another hour long discussion. Today we're talking about just the regular charging you do at home. When you charge an electric car, it's kind of like charging your cell phone. You plug it in, you walk away, you don't think about it. Whether you drive a Ford or a Chevy or a Nissan or a Mitsubishi, your car will have this connector on it. This Prius is Prime. a standard. Yeah, Right, the Prius Prime, the, the plug-in Prius. Uh, this is called a J1772, sometimes called a, a 1772 or a J-plug. Uh, we don't think about it, but if you go to a gas station, the gas hose fits your car, no matter what brand it is. Good, that's a good thing. Standards are a good thing. The only odd one out is the Tesla, and there's actually a couple of good reasons why they went with a, a different style, including how it works with their supercharger system. But if you buy a Tesla, it also comes with a little adapter. Guess what? It just plugs right in. So actually, Tesla is kind of secretly using the same system as well. So it's just that one standard, and when you get your car, it's going to come with some sort of a cable like this so you, you can plug it in. Now, when it comes to charging, Typically, they're designed for an overnight charge. 
most cars will not go longer than eight hours on 240 volts. Some cars on only a 120 volt charger, that can take a while. Um, a lot of the manufacturers, when they send this along with your car, they actually call it a trickle charger. So I definitely recommend having uh, 240 volt power. Uh, sometimes some of the Chevy Volt people uh, will just stick with 120 volt charging, which is slow, but if it's overnight, it's okay. And there's always that gasoline engine as, as a backup. With the uh, Prius Prime or East Prius Prime, if you totally to keep the battery just on 120, it'll be about five hours. And this is where I kind of want to bring in the theory of a bucket. You see a little image of a bucket in the corner. Uh, there are a few cars that have smaller batteries than a battery electric vehicle, including some of the, the plug-in hybrids, uh, the, the older Prius, uh, plug-in Prius, uh, the newer Prius Prime. No, well, mine was a aftermarket mod, and that's quit working, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, but the, uh, the Ford with their C-Max, they had a plug-in version of that, as well as the, um, uh, was the other one, the Fusion. Yeah, Fusion Energy. Those all have relatively small batteries. So you can think of those as having a very small bucket. And people will say, well, how long does it take to fill up a bucket? Well, it depends. Is it an ice cream pail? Is it a 55-gallon drum? And then also, what are you filling it with? Are you filling it with a garden hose? Or are you filling it with a fire hose? So that's where uh, our charging rates and current and our sizes of our battery uh, become important. Um, Chris, I think we might want to have you touch a little bit later on having a car with a very large battery versus what charging rate you actually charge at, because I, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, but rule of thumb, uh, you plug in the car, you walk away, it's fully charged overnight. My car is usually charged up in about four hours. So if I go somewhere in the morning, I'm back home in the middle of the day, I'll just put it on charge so I have a full battery again later when I go out. Uh, in general, electricity works out as being about a dollar per gallon, typically. There are also time of use plans. Are either of you guys on time of use? Yeah. We've got one yes, one no. I am also not on a time of use plan. If you're on a time of use plan, typically your electricity costs more during the day when maybe you're off at work. You're not using electricity at home. But then it costs less at night. It costs less on those off-peak um, hours where all the factories and the businesses and all, they're shut down. So we literally have like in Oak Creek, there's that fossil fuel plant. It's burning coal and it basically idles at night. There's actually excess capacity and they can't just shut it down because it's this huge thing, so they just kind of let it idle. There's uh, excess capacity. So if you do a time of use plan, electricity is equivalent to 50 cent per gallon gasoline. Now if you have solar panels and they've already paid for themselves, because you do have to buy them in the first place, uh, but once they're paid off, your fuel is literally free. So electricity on a bad day is a dollar per gallon. At night, it's 50 cents per gallon, and at solar, it's free. So again, just an example, at my house, I've got that 5,000 watts of solar. Uh, I can make 20 to 30 kilowatt hours per day, but I only have a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack. So I literally make more energy on a sunny day than my completely empty battery pack can absorb. Now the charger in that car is 3,300 watts, and I can make 5,000 watts. On a sunny day at my house, I can completely charge my car, power my garage, power my house, and power my next door neighbor. That's pretty cool. That is not something you will ever do with a gasoline car. Uh, another interesting thing is that a gallon of gasoline has approximately 34 kilowatt hours of energy in it. Uh, it varies a little bit depending if it's summer blend, winter blend, things like that. But basically on a sunny day, I make the equivalent of a gallon of gasoline every day in the summer. Uh, probably make about 20 kilowatt hours on either side of the equinoxes. So another thing that's kind of interesting is if you have solar, when do you want to charge your car? Um, for our panel here, when do you guys charge your car in general? During the day. <laughs> but I work at night, so. Okay, got a, got a guy working at night, so he charges his car during day. When the sun's shining, you're making power with solar. Chris? Originally, uh, and I'll get into this a little later, I, I, I had to switch from charging 
at night to during the day. And that was more or less due to We Energy's uh, trickery and billing practices. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm back to nighttime now, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. So the, the general rule of thumb actually is, even if you have solar with an electric car, the best time to charge is still at night in those off-peak hours because that's when that excess capacity is going on from during the grid. And then during the day when you're making that solar power, what's happening is you're actually helping to stabilize the grid. You're providing part of the power going to the grid instead of having uh, the power company, for example, fire up a natural gas peaker or some other uh, little more expensive, less efficient version of uh, a power source. Um, just real quick, because people ask this, can you make power in the winter? Yes, uh, they don't work so well if they're covered in snow, but even if you get a little bit of the snow off, it tends to melt off quickly. I found that cloudy days are actually much worse for solar power than just having snow up there. Uh, and it's really that we have cloudy weather in the winter that, that brings down the production. But with grid tie, it's all about averages. Um, if you have a couple of cloudy days followed by a couple of sunny days, on average, you're making half the power. That's just fine. And I think at this point, we're going to go to a couple of questions for the panel and then some questions um, from the audience. So I did make a couple of notes from you guys just when I talked to you ahead of time. Um, I was wondering, uh, now Tang, I know you had uh, a feature that you liked about having a plug-in car. Uh, Preheating. Can you tell uh, us about that real quick? Uh, basically, when it's really hot or really cold out like it is right now, um, well, you know, most people will usually start the car up, let it warm, run for a little bit to, you know, warm it up and everything. Um, with the Chevy Volt, and I think most electric cars have this feature too. But, Pretty um, much all of them. Yeah. But with the Volt, what I can do is I can remote start it, and it'll run the electric heater for 10 minutes. And while it's doing that, I'm not producing any carbon monoxide, so I can actually just turn it on in my garage while it's plugged in and, you know, just run off the electricity. And then when I leave for work, you know, my cabin is nice and warm and everything, and I don't have to sit in there or let it run and freeze for a few minutes and stuff like that. So that's one feature I really love about it. So if, if you heard this right, um, you can run an electric car in your garage with the heat with the door closed do not try that with a gasoline powered car when i built my garage that's one thing i wanted to be able to do was hop in a nice toasty car so my garage is insulated i hop in a nice warm car with a fully charged battery every single morning it's a it's kind of a nice feature oh like yeah that one. And, you know, with all the, you know, I'm sure if you guys watch the news, you know, they'll talk about how somebody was warming up the car and then they got stolen because they went into the house and everything. So, again, you know, since my car's in my garage and it's closed and you have to lock the door before you can turn on the remote start, then, you know, it, um, it just eliminates that completely. And, again, you're not wasting gas when you're doing it, so um, it costs even less to warm up the cabin and everything. And again, in the summer, you can do the same thing, except it runs the AC. Yep. So uh, that's another feature I love about it. So, so uh, Chris, one thing I wanted to ask you about is that um, now in a Tesla, I believe it's 80 amps for the max maximum charge rate? Uh, the first gen chargers, uh, you could actually have a second one installed. Using a, a wall high power charger. Yeah, um, uh, you, you get a what's called a high power wall charger. There's also it can also charge at 80 amps from a, a J1772 that supports it. It's just those are few and far between. The that that would be one of those uh, cables. It would actually have a very thick cable on it. Uh, remember, current creates heat. So, for example, this one this works great for my car. This will do 16 amps. You can't put 80 amps through this. Ooh. It would melt the cables. But more importantly there's a little bit of a signal in here that when you plug it into the car, this says to the car, hey, I'm only good for 16 amps, only charge at 16 amps. Whereas there's some other uh, connectors out there where they say, hey, I got a lot of power and the car can charge very quickly. Yeah. T Tesla kind of went backwards a little bit. Um, originally, we, um, you could get a second charger, which was called a dual charger, and you could charge at 80 amps. At 80 amps, I can charge at uh, from dead to full, about three and a half, four hours. On a, on a non DC fast charger. Uh, now, all the current S and the X cars are limited if you get the fast charger to 72 amps. 
but they also eliminated a component. It used to be two separate chargers that would work together. Now it's a single charger. You can either get a 48 amp standard charger or a 72 amp fast charger, which I still think is kind of stupid going backwards because electric cars, you always want the fastest charge. Now, do you always want the fastest charge no. though? Because sometimes you charge at a lower rate. Why would you do that? I always charge at a lower rate unless I absolutely have to. The faster you charge, you get more heat buildup. Um, to give you an example, for most of my charging, I just use the standard Tesla mobile connector with a 50 amp plug on the end. I turn my amperage down to about 32 amp charge rate. That mobile connector is capable of 40 amp charge rate. The reason is heat buildup. At 32 amps, there's less heat energy being wasted as heat by about 50% less heat than at charging at 40 amps. Um, I also noticed I burned a lot less mobile chargers out when I <laughs> turned the amperage down. Um, so I, on those, I only, only, only use the 40 amp if I absolutely have to. Uh, likewise, with my, uh, my uh, high-powered wall charger in my garage, which unfortunately, because my garage is also my workshop, uh, my car rarely ever gets to actually fit in my garage. So if I do have to use it, the garage door is open and half the car is sticking out so I can get the cord to reach. Um, so a few times I do use my high power wall charger. It is at the full charge rate because that's the only reason I'd actually need to do it. But um, likewise, uh, the components in the high power wall charger are thicker, are bigger and to handle the higher current. So uh, I usually turn that down to about 65 amps if I, if I can spare some time. Uh, to reduce the amount of heat buildup. So the, the couple of things this makes me think of is, remember we talked about current, you know, that, that creates heat. Um, but also, why charge at really high power for a short amount of time unless you specifically need that short amount of time? So most of the time, uh, typically people are charging overnight, so there's no reason to charge for, uh, you know, the only good reason out there right now to charge for a very quick amount of time is for these DC quick chargers when you're out on the road. Um, just going back to uh, this little setup here, what I think is pretty cool about my car only having a 16 amp charger built into it is the fact that I can literally charge straight off solar and not have uh, and still have power left over from that. Uh, the other thing we're going to start seeing in the future, and this is kind of interesting, is because uh, in the cord, it has that little bit of a signal that tells the car how fast it can charge on this. Um, that is not a set number. Um, I actually kind of stumbled on this last summer and I went, aha, invention idea. What if we have one that measures how much power you make from your solar and only put that much power into your car? You could literally have a setup where if a cloud came in front of the sun, your car would slow down its charging rate. And as the cloud moved, the sun came back out, your car would start charging quicker again. And you wouldn't pull any power at all from the grid. Fantastic idea. And so I went right home and checked the internet, see if anybody else did this idea. And about a week earlier, a company out of England had just started a Kickstarter. And so they have a, a setup called the Zappy and it actually uh, it measures how much power you're making from your solar, how much power you use in your house, and you can actually set it up so it only puts leftover electricity into your car. And we did mention earlier in some cases, if you sell your power to the grid, maybe you make less money doing that than if you, uh, the, the cost of um, buying it from the grid. Well, boy, there's a fantastic solution to that problem right there. Yes. Uh, uh, Tesla is doing this in, in a slightly different manner. Um, originally, the high power wall charger could be one charger per circuit breaker. Well, that didn't work out too well for things like uh, hotels where, all right, they don't want a, a whole 200 amp service just for one unit. And at the same time, if the only one unit's being used, well, why have it at a slower pace mm -hmm. and have idle, idle high powered wall chargers for other, other vehicles? So, for like businesses or even multiple family or multiple electric car homes. So the new version of the Tesla high powered wall charger can actually have up to, I think it was th either three, three or, or seven. It's one of those. I know it's at least three more, but it could be up to seven more additional high powered wall chargers um, connected to the base unit. 
So when just one vehicle is plugged in on, and it's plugged in, you know, it's a 100 amp circuit, that one vehicle could make use of the full 80 amps. But if you get car number two plugged in, well, then it'll split it between them. Yeah, it's power sharing. If three ca cars, it splits it again, so all three cars are getting the same equal amount of power. Four cars, well, now you're at uh, 20 amps per car. So overnight at a hotel, that might just be just fine. And it's right. the difference between uh, one car plugged in, hogging that station for the whole night, allowing nobody else to charge, or everybody can at least get a charge. Yeah, there's actually a communication cable run between uh, the individual units and that signal uh, going to the cars telling them how much they can draw, uh, that signal actually gets changed. It's, it's a neat setup. So. Uh, in terms of wear and tear on the battery, how rechargeable are rechargeable batteries? Quite rechargeable. Uh, well, uh, with your mind on these things? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting Chevy Volt in, out there. Uh, the guy's name's Eric Baumer. He drives a 2012 Volt. He's driven, I think, 400 and getting close to 450,000 miles on his Volt now. And I think of that, he's driven about 160,000 of it on electric. And I think he's only seen maybe like 3% degradation. So he's basically, he's not getting as much out of it as he did before. But um, it, it hasn't... Uh, degraded yeah. that badly because and at that point the gas car would pretty much be at its end of life already right. yeah yeah, yeah. I, I like to think uh, you know um even when the hybrids first came out there were always these rumors oh you're gonna have to replace the battery every two years it's gonna cost you ten or fifteen thousand dollars which none of that was true at all um i like to think of the battery packs on cars as being approximately the same as a transmission it's a core important part of the car do they ever go bad Sure, you know, are, are there ever lemons? Yes, which are then replaced under warranty. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, battery technology has really evolved very, very quick in the last couple of years. It's been absolutely tremendous, and the adoption of plug-in vehicles has taken off at a much faster rate than it ever did with the hybrid vehicles. Uh, lastly, for the batteries, um, temperature control is important in terms of battery longevity. Uh, a car like the Chevy Volt has a really clever active thermal system. Uh, likewise, the Tesla has a, a really, it's, it's an amazing computer design system, it's fantastic. And even when, when Chris was talking about heat and charging at a lower rate, um, on my way over, I used a, a public quick charger and on my car, it, it has, it's a little bit more low tech. It's an air cooled system. But when I plug into the fast charger, you hear the air conditioner turn on and it's actually the big squirrel cage fan is actively cooling the battery while it's charging, which is kind of a little odd when you plug the car in here. But it's uh, kind of fun for a little bit, uh, a little more low tech design. Are there any applications that um, either hybrid owners or PHEV owners or EV, EV owners um, can use to monitor the performance of their battery? Yeah, there are apps. Port. I, I, yeah. can, I can touch on the Teslas. Um, okay. um, now, Tesla is pretty closed of a system. In fact, the OBD port, only thing you'll get out of that is 12 volts in the VIN number. And that's a legal requirement. Um, I have a little thing called, uh, an app called Tesla Spy. And a specially made cable that plugs into the a diagnostic port behind my center screen. And that allows me to see uh, pretty much the voltage of every every one of the 96 bricks of battery cells, uh, the temperature of, of each battery sheet, um, what the car thinks the battery is actually charged at in the kilowatt hours compared to uh, uh, what the car thinks the actual capacity of the pack is, uh, the balance of each cell. Um, unfortunately, that is a third-party thing. Does Elon know you're using it? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, they they keep trying to lock things down, but uh, just like jailbreaking an iPhone, they keep finding a way. And uh, unfor uh, unfortunately for Tesla, going this route, the only way they could stop us on existing car well, they really can't on existing cars. The only thing they can do is change things going forward. Um, you pretty much can't do anything on a Tesla without a sanctioned Tesla laptop and their own special cable. So uh, we can't program anything on the car. We can only read certain CAN bus data. And uh, we have no idea 
on the Model 3 yet, if it's even going to be possible. Um, they might have gone a different route, but on the S and the X, we can at least uh, read some of the CAN bus data at this time. Yeah, there, there are um, small little Bluetooth readers you can just buy off uh, Amazon.com, places like that, that will let you um, check the, um, the health quality of a battery. So if you're in the market for a used Nissan Leaf, for example, there's actually a little app and you can plug in just a small, like a $20 or $30 Bluetooth device into the car. It's actually you the same program, or Tesla Spy, Leaf Spy. Yeah, they're made by the same guy, I think. Yep. So it's a, a little, it plugs into the ODB2 port, and it will give you all the data on all the individual cells in the car. So you can check, for example, because one of the few cars there was issues with degra battery degradation in was the early Nissan Leafs in warm states. So like if you had a 2011 Leaf from Arizona, that very well could have had some pretty bad battery degradation. And the reason why is they made uh, these bulletproof battery packs that were completely sealed up. So they were literally airtight. They didn't have any active cooling whatsoever. Um, the only upside to that is if you ever find one that was in a flood, you can take it apart and the battery's still good. Um, in general though, um, Electric cars are great, used electric cars are great, but what I, I wanted to bring it back to was in terms of monitoring, monitoring solar. So do either of you two guys have a whole house energy system that shows how much electricity you're using in your house, including how much solar you're, you're using or creating? I, I don't have a monitor no. that way. I can monitor, um, I use, I don't have micro inverters. Um, I have a single solar edge uh, inverter, but I have the solar edge monitoring. So each, each panel, has its own energy MPPT to get the most efficient, most power per panel. Doesn't matter if one panel shaded, um, and then the actual inverter uh, sends back to a, the web, uh, my own private web page uh, from Solar Edge, and I can monitor how much I'm pr producing. Um, unfortunately, without getting something that taps into either the, my uh, house side meter or something, one of the clampons that go inside the breaker box, I have no way of knowing. Uh, what the actual house is using because we energies doesn't want us to know that because then they can't make as much money <laughs> There's basically all the solar systems out there will have some form or another of a monitoring system on it That it will will tell you how much power you're creating um, And depending on the brand name and the, the style it varies some it's just a very small amount of information other systems It's quite a lot of information uh, one advantage with me using these microinverters is that I actually have information on every single solar panel. So right now on my phone, I can tell you what the upper left corner solar panel is doing right now. Uh, frankly, that's way too much information. That's just for like the nerds. Uh, in general, what you really want to know is, okay, at, at the end of the month, how much power am I making? Although it is useful, for example, for something like troubleshooting, I actually had uh, a breaker pop on me for no gosh darn good reason, and it turned out it was just a, a bad circuit breaker and I replaced it, everything's been great since then. Uh, this also will tell me uh, how much power I've made since I've installed the system. Uh, I've made 4.92 megawatt hours of energy uh, since I, I put up the solar this past summer, and that could power 163 houses for a day or you know they've got some of these kind of ridiculous comparisons or it's the equivalent of planting 87 trees or offsetting 3.4 tons of carbon you know there's different ways of looking at it but it's kind of nice that you can monitor and know how much energy that you have um, there is something that I call the the missing megawatt and I know how much power I pull from the grid I know how much power I push from the grid just from my um, my power meter and I know how much solar I make and I compared those numbers I'm missing about one megawatt hour of energy and at first I thought ah power company scamming me here they're they're not paying me for my power something like that and it took me a minute to realize that I don't have a, a device in my breaker panel that actually measures how much power I'm using in the home so that missing megawatt is literally the electricity that I made on my garage and I used in my car, my garage, or my house. So it was directly used. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't leave my property, uh, which is kind of cool because that's power that I would have had to bring in from a coal burning power plant or something like that. So remember at the beginning I talked about that, that efficiency and how things get lost on the way? Even with wind power, if you got wind turbines way out somewhere, 
that power has to be transmitted, there's transmission line losses. If you take AC power from the solar on your garage, you run it straight into your car, that's about as efficient as you can get, period. It's really, really tough to beat. The only way you can do better than that is a DC to DC system and skip that 3% loss going into here. Um, I've done that, but that was on a 48 volt electric vehicle. Um, our, our commercially built electric vehicles are usually in the range of like 360 volts or so, and you do not want to be running DC to DC three or 400 volts, um, not without uh, being an electrical engineer and having a lot of insurance. Um, just one more thing I want to point out, and then if there's any other questions, we'll take care of that. Um, just the last thing I want to say is, what about the future? And I really think that in the future, we will all use more electricity, because electricity is great. Use it for everything, you know, computers, cars, whatever. But it can also be used for things like um, mini-split heat pump heaters. So maybe you want to get away from using natural gas in your home, or heaven forbid you still have an old oil-burning furnace. You can use electricity as a replacement for that, but efficient electricity. So instead of having a resistive electric heater, you could use a heat pump, which is basically like an air conditioner in reverse, to heat your home or at least part of your home. Or uh, there's a, uh, some neat water heaters now, too, that work in a similar way. Um, another thing in the future, vehicle to grid and vehicle to home will be a thing. And that is actually using your vehicle to completely power your home in a blackout or help stabilize the grid or power your neighborhood. Uh, I've got a friend down in Puerto Rico. He's got a Prius. Well, the hurricane came through. Guess what he did? He put an inverter on the 12-volt battery on his Prius, and he ran his whole house off of his car. Now, granted, it was, was being sourced from the, the gasoline engine there, but if you have a giant rolling battery, you can power things with it. I've run my whole house off of my electric motorcycle in a blackout, and so we're going to be seeing more things like that in the future, but on the commercial scale. So maybe you'll buy uh, a new truck, and instead of running a generator at a construction site, You'll just plug all your power tools right into the truck, charge them right off the battery. Uh, lastly, um, if you are doing any home remodeling, if you're building a new home, if you're building a garage, please at least put in a dedicated 50 amp, 240 volt electric outlet. Um, that's, that's good for up to 40 amps of charging of an electric car. And you know what, if you don't have an electric car, when you sell your house, the next guy who buys your house, he will have an electric car. And when you sell that house saying, hey, I'm already all set up for whatever car you have, that's a selling point. I have multiple um, NEMA 1450 electric outlets in my garage so that when I pull my car inside, I can charge on either side of the garage. I can have a friend visit. I've had uh, Tesla Model Xs just stop on by. And I say, great, plug in. You know, it's nice and sunny out. You're charging right off the sun. So at a bare minimum, please, in the future, keep in mind any remodeling or anything put in some power for a, uh, a car. I'm going to take that one step further. You can still put in your 50 amp outlet, but size the wire for two gauge. Gene, quiet. Uh, size the wiring for uh, two gauge, then you can have up to 100 amp. So if you uh, want to put in that high power wall charger, I mean, just, just speaking from a Tesla perspective, because that's the perspective I have, and then you can always branch off with additional high power wall chargers to do eventually, you know, a one, you know, a gas car family might have one electric car and then down the road two and then you got kids and you have three and maybe four cars so that way you can support multiple cars charging overnight and if you have an electrician at your place doing some wiring anyways it's very very cheap to upgrade from a 120 volt outlet to a 240 volt outlet it's uh just the materials cost is not that much more so if you're doing any kind of remodeling work anything like that please consider putting in some good dedicated power for a future electric car so, do we have uh, any other questions for our panelists? I, I was only partially understanding what you were talking about when you said something about that you would need a Tesla computer system to do anything. Uh, that was in response to being able to actually see the condition of the battery pack. Um, in general, <clears throat> a Tesla is like an, I an iPhone. It, it just works. Uh, and it, they, they wanted to make the experience as painless as possible in general, but then, you know, except for us people that, you know, 
our attention ho or not, uh, uh, information whores, where we want as much information. It doesn't matter if we can't even use it. We just want that information. Um, the average person, all you need to know about is, okay, I'm going to go plug in. Boom, done. All right, car says I got about 250 miles of rated range. Good. That's, I can go about 250 miles. You don't need to know the temperatures of the battery pack. The, the Tesla system is so far advanced, and we're talking originally pretty much designed for 2012 was the original release of the Model S. And it's, it's basically foolproof. There's nothing as a vehicle owner that you can really do to kill that battery pack. It even, they even went as far as um, it actively heats the pack when it's too cold. It cools the pack when it's too hot. It balances all the cells automatically as needed. Um, it, they even have hidden capacity that we can't touch below zero. So if you drive the car to the point where um, <laughs> systems are shutting down, and uh, I won't tell you how many times I've gone there, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've been driving back before superchargers even existed. Um, the car will shut down. It, there's, it's got a couple kilowatt hours reserved in the battery to prevent the battery from getting damaged. So there's almost nothing you can do. You'd pretty much have to drive the car to the point where it shuts itself down and then leave it sit without plugging it back in for about three months before you even cause damage to the battery. And even then, all it takes is a, a Tesla employee with their magic laptop to plug back in and a 120 volt outlet or 120 volt connection to the car through the UMC and then the car will automatically run its own diagnostics at that point, uh, check the condition of the battery pack, and then wake itself back up to allow, allow everything to go back in. And that's after sitting for three months completely dead. Is it true, is it my understanding that Tesla actually downloads information from oh, yes. every car? You agree to that when you buy the car. Okay. Um, so as your car is sitting in the garage, unattended Tesla can go in now with, with and pull information from it. With recent firmware updates, you now have a toggle because it's, it's all privacy stuff now. Um, you have a toggle where you can turn off remote diagnostics and, and data sharing. It's kind of like doing a Windows update. Yeah. And it's uh, not a bad thing that they're pulling information from your car. There, it's, it's nothing that's personally identifiable um, unless there's, uh, they, they've taken an occasion a proactive approach to problems. I had a cooling pump go out. Uh, they told me that. And actually, did, it just threw a fault. It didn't even fail. One of three. Only need two to actually operate. Um, they called me at 7 p.m. Uh, at 7 a.m. I had a Ranger at my car, uh, a Tesla Ranger at my house replacing the pump. Uh, but they're, they're, they're downloading now with autopilot. Um, they're downloading about, uh, about 700 megabytes to several gigabytes per day from the cars over their own cellular connection. And that's pulling, you know, uh, historical data from the car, how the battery packs are, are holding up conditions, uh, any faults on the system so they can compare it against the fleet. Um, you know, this batch of cars is starting to have problems with premature failure of this component. Well, now we know that there's something wrong with that batch. We'll prove it for the next batch of cars. Um, they're monitoring the GPS data for autopilot to create their own more accurate maps and mapping systems. Uh, now with Autopilot 1 and 2, um, they're actually using um, uh, shadowing the actual driver. Um, this is what the car would think it would have done in this situation, while well, the driver overrid it, or the driver did this instead in this situation. So they're building the neural net for the Autopilot and ten autonomous driving. So our e every mile that's driven, our Autopilot and future autonomous driving is going to be getting better. And so I, I think I'm going to butt in there and say that uh, Chris is a Tesla nerd and has a YouTube channel. So if you go on YouTube, look up K-Man Auto. He's got a big pile of uh, videos all about the, the very, very specifics of the Tesla. He, I, and, I mean, we could go on for hours about just that one thing. Today, we, we, we kind of wanted to focus on actually just working with electric cars and home solar together. Uh, one thing I, I kind of skipped over, I was talking about using my home solar system as an example earlier. Uh, basically, on my solar system, it basically works out to being able to drive a car about 100 miles a day, um, you know, just taking a look at averages. 
So it's kind of nice to um, just put some perspective in terms of, of distance versus energy produced. Um, I think that's more or less going to be about us other than, uh, I know we don't want to take all day here, but we want to cover any questions you have too. Yeah, uh, well, and that's, that's another thing that is kind of interesting is people say, oh, well, how long is it going to cost me to, uh, how long will it take me until those solar panels pay for themselves? Uh, most solar panels have a 25-year warranty on them. Um, and, you know, a, a solar system might pay for itself in 6 to 15 years, depending on how much you had to pay for it in the first place. Um, these are literally good forever. We use them in outer space and they keep going. Um, last I checked, the Mars rover was still running. That's just got a couple of solar panels on it, and it's on like the dustiest planet in our solar system. That's been going for way longer than they thought. Um, these are pretty much indestructible with the exception of like literally somebody shooting at them, things like that. Uh, the inverters are electronic, and occasionally they do have problems. Um, in the case of a typical serial string inverter, which might be on the side of your house, in your garage, or your basement, big metal box, um, should something bad happen to those, A, they have warranties, and even if, if not, they're at least easy to replace. One downside of microinverters is they're typically right under the solar panel, which means I got 24 of these on the roof of my garage. Heaven forbid one of these, there's a problem with it, it burns out or something, I have to take the solar panel off the roof of my garage and replace it. That was one concern that I had with them, but at the same time, if I had a problem with one of them, I have one solar panel that goes down, whereas if you have a, a serial string inverter, all your solar goes down. Uh, so kind of two different philosophies there. But in general, lightning, surges, things like that, they're just simply not a problem. So how many of those microbes do you have? 24, one, one with each solar panel. How many solar panels do each of you guys have? 25. I think I said 22 panels. I got one inverter for the whole string, but then I have a power optimizer on each panel. Yeah, so generally right now, um, home solar systems are usually uh, between three and six kilowatts, tends to be typical. Uh, six kilowatts is a pretty big system though. Um, I built a garage, it's, it's a big garage, and we literally covered the roof with those solar panels. I mean, it's just, um, that's two garage doors plus a man door on the left, and that's an 18 foot tall building and the entire south side of that roof is covered in solar panels. I actually have a sample of my metal roofing over here, um, and I brought some accessories if you guys want to see like how solar is attached to roofs, things like that. Um, certainly uh, afterwards, come take a look. There's an another thing that I have at my house is I actually have an old school analog meter that, um, you know, some of these places where they switch out the meters, there's companies that buy out those old rotary mechanical ones, and those are, they're still used at like campgrounds and places, but I just rigged it up with a too big uh, a plug and a jack on it so that I could plug anything I wanted into it. So it's kind of nice to, if I want to know exactly how much power my car uses over a period of months, I could charge the car just exclusively through that manual mechanical meter and separately track how much information I use there. And in a lot of cases with solar, um, people can also have uh, an additional meter installed. Uh, there are revenue grade meters that kind of like by law, the power company has to say, yeah, that's a good one. It's not just an estimate, it's really tracking it. So sorry you had issues with your meter, but there are other ways of monitoring and keep it, keeping track of how much power you're making. Uh, one thing I will add to that is that, um, you know, back in the good old days, there was the, the meter made where somebody would actually come to your house and read that meter. Um, and nowadays, it's usually, it's getting to be electronic communications with the power company. Um, if you get solar installed, uh, there's probably pretty good chances that there will be a delay with the power company actually getting them to come on out and check it and putting their stamp of approval on that. Uh, how long did you guys have to wait after having your solar before the months? About two months. Months. <laughs> okay, and keeping in mind that some of these uh, like tax credits, for example, are going away. If you want to do solar, please do it sooner rather than later. Save yourself some money that way and be able to get uh, producing power as soon as possible. I also found um, that in my case, the, I found out that the power company was manually calculating 
uh, my power usage because it was all electronic, but back at their home office, it was actually a clerk subtracting the one number from the other. And this is because it's a small power company and there's like two people in town with solar. So, you know, they don't have an automated system for it or anything. But it, I, I got my electric bill and I'm like, wait, I know how much power I made. I can check that. And this doesn't sound right. So I, I caught a clerical error. So power companies do make mistakes. So it is worth, you know, get your solar up sooner rather than later. And it's good to double check your power production at least right away. Um, I've also done some contract work for a certain solar power company for a while because the guy who does the hiring stopped, he was driving past my house while I was literally putting up solar. He's like, hey, how do you want to come work for us? And I, so I, I did some troubleshooting and saw some weird things. Um, one person had their solar up and running for three months and said, this, this is weird, my electric bill is still the same. Well, We Energies never put in her second meter, and this was like four months after getting the solar installed. Uh, I saw another one where the woman had the two meters, and it should have been tracking, sending, and receiving, but her actual solar equipment, uh, it was set up correctly. She was making all her own solar power. I had to go through all of her, uh, her electric bills, and I found one that in tiny print at the bottom, said this is an estimate and what happened is because basically she went from using a certain amount of power every month to using no power the power company thought her meter was broken and simply billed her the same amount of money as they did the previous month and did that for like three or four months in a row and you know the meters were working it was tracking it, it should have been right but the power company said oh that can't be right We'll just charge you what we charged you last month. So there's still instances where, like, sometimes estimates are used. So keep your eye on the power company. I mean, uh, you know, I like my power company, but, you know, a, a clerk can make a mistake. So, you know, look at those power bills. Know how much power you use. Know how much power you make. But when it's all said and done, you can literally power your entire house and an electric car from solar. And I think that's pretty darn cool. I just wanted to comment too uh, for folks that are interested but think it's too expensive. I got my solar panels through uh, a solar group ride project, which the city of Milwaukee was running. Basically, what they did was the city worked with a solar panel in, uh, installation company where they would um, buy a lot of solar panels and then they would um, agree to install people's houses for a certain amount and everything. And then the idea was that a lot of people would then uh, kind of, you know, band together and buy, you know, the, get solar installs from that company at the same time so that the cost could be lower and everything. And when they um, looked at my bills and, uh, or my electric usage and they, you know, they looked at my roof and everything, they, they gave me an estimate, size estimate and everything. And they said, okay, it'll probably cost about this much and everything. And uh, since it turned out to be a lot cheaper than I thought, I decided to make the plunge into it. So um, I think they did, what they were doing at first was uh, neighborhoods, like I think they started in uh, uh, Shorewood, I think. There's been a number of group buys, the Milwaukee area, yeah. Madison then, area. Then they did, yeah, like Bayview, and then I think last year they did Wauwatosa in Milwaukee. Uh, Jefferson County right now. Yeah. So, you know, keep an eye out on it. Um, I think, is it the Midwest Renewable Energy right. Association that uh, passes that information along? Yeah, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association is an excellent nonprofit educational uh, organization that I, I took a solar class through the MREA and then I put up my own solar panels. And they do uh, the energy fair uh, every summer in Custer near Stevens Point, um, the weekend closest to the solstice. So I think it's June 17 to 19 this year. Um, if you're interested in solar, the Energy Fair is a great place to go to learn more about solar and talk to solar installers, talk about pricing, talk about any other uh, special situations that you might have. Any other questions?